from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We're here to listen to and to talk to historian Simon Shaman. Now, I was recently watching his, uh, his latest documentary uh, in his new book called uh, The American Future, A History, which I believe is actually airing on, on WETA these days. And there he tells us that the, the genius of America is its capacity for constant reinvention. And I think it's fair to say that um, much the same can be said for Simon Shama. Uh, he is a writer who delves into an extraordinarily vast range of topics with seemingly equal ease and ambition in each case. I could run through the bio, but you all have it in the program. Um, you know, it, it talks about how he teaches art, uh, history, and history at Columbia University, and it lists many of his award-winning works. But instead, I just want to read very briefly uh, a portion of a review that ran in the Washington Post recently about his work, which does a much better job than I could of, of summarizing him and describing him. Who does Simon Shama think he is? The Columbia University historian seems to have few intellectual limits and to require little sleep. He has written pathbreaking books about Dutch history and culture, the Rothschilds and the creation of Israel, sprawling narratives about the revolution in France and slavery during the revolution in America, a thick study of Rembrandt, a postmodern historical novel, dozens of provocative essays about art, and multi-part television documentaries about the history of Britain and the work of great artists, both of which attracted millions of viewers. Now Shama has chosen to examine the meaning of America's entire past and to suggest why it has culminated quite happily in his view with the election of Barack Obama. On campuses all over the nation, I suspect there are historians guiltily hoping that this time, Shama's reach has finally exceeded his grasp. They will be disappointed. I'm delighted to introduce Simon Shama, and I can assure you for the next half hour, we will not be disappointed. Thank you, thank you. All right, class, settle down. Settle. There will be an exam at the end of this. I'm a professor. What did you expect? Um, my favorite, one of my favorite Broadway shows, actually, Spamalot, uh, takes <laughs> great work of historical documentation, takes exception to the usual rule about saying, make sure your cell phones are turned off by saying, will you please turn your cell phones on because the show is crap, actually. So, I, I, if you want to talk among yourselves, or you know, um, that's fine. I just noticed that my publisher, um, in his wisdom, um, have just brought out the audiobook of the American Future, and it was sort of a real vote of confidence in the mischief of the title. That if you look at the, the I, I regret to say, um, ominously unabridged reading, which is wonderful to listen to, um, especially if you suffering from insomnia, it's a nice way to get to sleep. But the, the vote of confidence, um, which had me worrying a bit, it says, the, the American future, and then in tiny, tiny, tiny little letters underneath, a history. So the notion was that I would be a prophet, really, rather than someone who talks about the past. But the entire point of the project was not really to survey the whole meaning of American history, even my temerity doesn't quite reach that far. But to say something, really, which is a Washington statement, that paradoxically, in a country which gets a bad rap elsewhere in the world, wrongly in my view, having lived here half my life, having a short attention span, history has, is actually the meat and drink. I mean, this tent is a testimony to this. Uh, you hearing from brilliant historians like John Meacham and in their different ways, um, Ken Burns is a testimony to how much history has actually meant to American history to American people. I was made aware of this a long time ago, actually, when I was a, a feckless young faculty member in Cambridge, and two adorable old ladies, I rather think, from Virginia or North Carolina, were walking through the ornamental Tudor court of my Cambridge College, and within my own hearing, one said, "Oh, Mabel, don't you just love history?" It's so old. Uh, <laughs> those of us who are getting up there know what she means, but there's some way in which history is always young, too. 
Here's the extraordinary paradox about the American relationship to history, I think, is that, of course, in its fundamental ways, the United States of America came into being as a separation from the past, a separation from monarchy, a separation from the authority of mere precedent. But on the other hand, people like Jefferson, in particular, who was an avid borrower of history books from the, one of the earliest circulating libraries, not in Philadelphia, but at Williamsburg, Virginia, were very conscious that what they were recovering was an old historic tradition of liberty. So just at the same time that Jefferson was writing drafts of the Declaration of Independence, he was delving back into the debates about democracy that had taken place more than a century before during the interregnum, the period that ended with Charles, the execution of Charles, of Charles I. So from the beginning, there was this sense that Americans were really rescuing a tradition of freedom that had been betrayed by the English and the British themselves, betrayed by George III, betrayed by the Redcoats. So history, yes, very, very old, but perpetually young. And I say this now here in Washington, this particular moment, because this book and the series was indeed an attempt to marry two things that you would think ought never to be married up together, on-the-road reporting of the campaign, which we followed with the BBC team through 2008, and windows back into the past. And it struck me very early on that the person who was going to win the election was the person who could tell America the best, most penetrating, and most fearlessly honest story, it, story about itself. And that person, I think, did indeed, some of you have a different opinion, go on to win the election. It's not that John McCain is in any sense oblivious or indifferent to history. It's just that Barack Obama was intensely saturated in its, its difficult meaning. How many of you, were any of you here on Inauguration Day? I was here, yeah, freezing ourselves to death, but it, warmed by our own sense of the exhilaration of the historical moment. And do you remember, Obama essentially gave us, as he is prone to do, possibly excessively, even for uh, a professor of history like me, he gave us essentially a historical lecture. I thought how extraordinary it was that we had that journey with Barack Obama on that um, violently cold day, which went from, um, it went through a kind of procession of moments of epic suffering from people who braved all the worst things that the ocean could, could bring them as slaves or as destitute immigrants to people who are suffering real hardship out there on the frontier. And the meaning, I think, that Obama essentially, what he seized in the campaign and in the election was a sense of saying, this is not an election where it's business as usual. America is at a crossroads. It's at a crossroads in the way in which it relates to the world, in which it thinks hard and painfully about the causes for which we spill the blood of our children and our treasure. It's at a crossroads in the way we understand the relationship of our government, our government, to our people. And I think it was because actually those big historical themes resounded over and over again. Um, that he sort of took charge rhetorically of what the campaign was about. He was also, I think, unafraid, remarkably, to sort of back off from a smiley face view of history. History comes essentially often in two flavors. One is the story we tell ourselves about ourselves to make us feel good. And there's not, nothing really particularly wrong with that, but it runs the danger simply of an exercise in self-congratulation. John was just here, and I love his book about Andrew Jackson, but I want Andrew Jackson to be removed from the $20 bill. Andrew Jackson was our first, most aggressive, most adamant ethnic cleanser. And it wasn't, you know, I heard the question quite rightly asked about the Indian removal. This is a painful truth. It doesn't mean to say we're bad as a nation. It doesn't mean to say we have to wring our hands about everything in our American past. But it is also true that in 1829-30, when the five nations were deported across 
the Mississippi with the loss of between a quarter and a third of all of those who had to undertake that terrible trail of tears. Voices at the time, like Davy Crockett, for example, and Edward Everett said, this will forever be a stain on our national past. We have violated our most solemn undertakings, those undertaken between the Cherokee and Thomas Jefferson in particular. And, you know, this, I don't want, no, none of us should ever feel ashamed about our American identity, but it is the great glory, strength, and virtue, thank God, of the Western historical tradition that we are grown up enough to tell honest stories about ourselves. When does our, our, that tradition begin? It begins with Thucydides, the history of the Peloponnesian, Peloponnesian Wars. Why did Thucydides, who was a general who fought on a remote theater in that campaign, write it? He didn't write it in order to say how impeccably behaved the Athenians had been, how all the decisions of their generals and their politicians had been drenched in virtue and, and foresight. He wrote it to get to the great tragic denouement of the expedition to Syracuse, the expedition of, of great overreach. Thucydides was not afraid to write something for the Athenians so that democracy would survive, but survive on an historical bedrock of truth. And that is the difference, everybody here, between us and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's definition of history. What got to me in those notorious remarks about which I waxed slightly wrathful in the pages of the Financial Times was the point when Ahmadinejad said, um, why is it that there's been no research on the Holocaust? <laughs> Excuse me. Who would like to join me in a a personal expedition of ambush to bring him to the Holocaust Memorial Museum and lock him in for about a year. <laughs> History is about facing the truth. It's about the victory of evidence over blind faith. It's about the victory of honest self-examination over credulous fanaticism. And that's the sort of history that I try and tell in the American future, and which, you know, to its honor in high schools all over the country, although everybody here, I wish it weren't called social studies. How many of you, how many of you are high school here? Put up your hands. Wow, not many. Okay, there should be a whole lot more. I think it's just our friend down here. But, you know, can, can we start a campaign right here and now to abolish the term social studies. Why should, history, why should history be the discipline that dare not speak its name? The part, so. The answer is McGraw-Hill. Are you here? And the orthopedic surgeons of America. High schoolers with social studies textbooks. History matters, and it matters now more than ever. And let me see, where are we? Three o'clock, okay. Got five minutes more. I just want to, I, I'd love to hear from you, class, before I let you go. We are at a very, very serious moment still um, in the history of the country, and perhaps nowhere more serious. The economy, God knows, is something we all have to be exercised about wherever we live and whatever our fortunes and misfortunes. But ultimately, as the Founding Fathers knew, which is why I talk about this in the book, the debate between Jefferson and Hamilton over what kind of place West Point would be matters so critically because Jefferson, who charted it, something that's often forgotten, Jefferson, one of the few of the Founding Fathers who was not an active soldier, in order to be as much a place for the training of civil engineers uh, as for a military, uh, a, a, cast, a, a class of military officers. Hamilton, on the other hand, 
was less interested in civil engineering. It took a much more, we would recognize, pragmatic, tough stance about why we needed a place like West Point, a wonderful place, by the way, where uh, I, I've, I've given talks to the extraordinarily gifted and, um, and brave young men and women who are being educated there. Um, but what Hamilton said is, why should we alone in all the world of the powers, destined as we are to be a global power, tie one hand behind our back in effect? Why should we not have um, a class of trained professional military officers? Jefferson's answer to that was because we do not want to be like Prussia. We do not want to be, we do not want to give ourselves a class of military officers who one day will, will slaughter, will knife to death the frail uh, and precious creature that is a young democracy. And that debate really has gone on through the ages. But I began The American Future as a television series and as a book on Veterans Day 2007 um, at Arlington. And I remember looking really to Arlington Hill, you know, up at Arlington Hill, and knowing that the, the, the house that looks down onto the National Cemetery belonged to Robert E. Lee as I'm sure many of you know. What I really didn't know was that man who founded Arlington National Cemetery, one of the great builders of Washington, he, he was responsible for the construction of the Iron Dome of the capital of Washington's aqueduct, the water supply. He built the beautiful building now used as a building museum, which was the veterans building after the Civil War. Man, the quartermaster general of the Union, a man called Montgomery Meigs, who's really the hero of my book. Meggs and Lee had both been to West Point. They were both very close friends. And they'd surveyed the Mississippi together. They'd actually done the civil engineering job in 1837, lived together in very close company to try and change the course of the river to prevent St. Louis, the young St. Louis, from being uh, inundated. They'd then gone their separate ways, Meggs essentially to building both forts and civil, in, uh, civil buildings. Come the eve of the Civil War. Robert E. Lee, as you remember, was offered command of both armies, and Meigs, to his astonishment and horror, discovered that Lee was going to accept what he called the invitation of my countrymen, namely take command, as far as Meigs was concerned, of the wrong side. And from that moment on, Meigs, who had not been a fierce abolitionist, um, and who had a brother who actually produced what became uniforms for the Confederate Army, became a passionate abolitionist and very, very violent and militant indeed in his contempt for the treason which he said that Lee had committed. It was Meggs who had been entertained to tea, and those of us who are British here knows there's no more social accolade that can be bestowed than being invited to tea, He'd been invited to tea by Mrs. Lee in Arlington House on the hill, who expropriated the estate as, uh, as a sort of kind of proxy punishment to the Lees for having done the wrong thing when it mattered. He said in a chilling sentence to his wife, they will never come home again. Instead, their home was to become the burial place of the honored, of the honored dead. So history mattered to Montgomery Meigs. It mattered then. It's in our blood. When we think about our future, we have to think as Meigs did. Meigs was a reluctant warrior. The Civil War for him was a war of necessity, not a war of choice. That's been the great and glorious tradition in the United States. And what we owe it to ourselves, however we come down, whichever side we come down on, is to have a debate full, forthright, eloquent debate about what exactly we are doing in Afghanistan. And this does not make me maybe applauding prematurely. I'm not saying this as someone who is actually necessarily against the president's commitment to Afghanistan. My instincts are that it's going to be incredibly tough for sending our children to carry out, however, tens or hundreds of thousands we do, an incredibly difficult mission which no other foreign power has ever accomplished. But, my friends, I want to say, I want to remind us what happens if the Taliban returns to power in Afghanistan and if an arc of fundamentalist militant fundamentalism is established from Afghanistan through Iran, perhaps all the way to Shiite Iraq and Beirut. 
it behooves us to remember that the Taliban essentially are waging a war of moral atrocity against the education of women. All those thousands of schools that have opened will be shut down and their teachers imprisoned or worse. The Taliban is waging, I say to you, here in this book festival, the first war against words. And that should give us pause. That should give us pause. It may not necessarily be enough to sustain what will be a great hardship if indeed we do as a nation decide to do this. But that we know the enemy of books, the enemy of words, and the enemy of history is, I think, without question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Goodness, I'm sorry to sound, sound so solemn at the end. I just want to, I've been reminded by myself to say that I'll be signing, I think I'm, uh, on the program it says I'm signing from four to five, I'm not. Um, I'm signing um, from 3.30, which is um, a little sooner than we thought, to about 4.15 or so. Um, so hurry up and, um, and come and see me. D did your study in yes. writing and teaching of art history prepare you to write uh, American history? Yes, uh, I, you know, I th that's very kind of you to say that. If you, you may know, um, uh, as um, the Duke of Gloucester said to, to Edward Gibbon, another thick, damn thick, square, fat book. One of my damn thick, square, fat books was a book called Landscape and Memory, which appeared in 1995. And um, that is really about... So I, f I feel very warmly towards Ken Burns and Dayton Duncan's new project. It was really about the images with which America represented itself to itself in the, in the, in the 1800s. And um, my wife uh, comes from, she's a, a real American, unlike you lot, she's a cattle rancher's daughter. Um, my father-in-law has just gone to his happy hunting ground as the, one of the two lion hunters for the state of Nevada. Um, so I was actually always very interested in the, in the imagery of the West. So in a, in a weird way, actually thinking about painters like Thomas Cole and Frederick Edwin Church um, and Asher Durand and the kind of the sort of romantic mythology of America, actually. I hadn't quite finished the other. Usually it's I who interrupt other people, actually. This is, this is the first. <laughs> it, <laughs> right, Gracie. Yep, sir. I have to welcome you, and then I also contract with all the data to say that the Supreme Court takes the Oh, it's another tense. Oh, God. I thought I was hearing voices. Okay, it's another. <laughs> a scary moment. I thought I was being visited by the Mormon prophet for a moment, you know. So. Yeah, God, okay. Right, I'm so sorry. Yes, young lady there. As an historian, do you worry that so much of the communication among people today is electronic and therefore ephemeral, whether future historians will have much less to work with than historians like you have? Well, you know, I mean, uh, you, you're absolutely right. The first sort of instinct is to worry. Um, you all heard the question about, you know, the electronic obsession of the young. There are so many. It's such an important question. Um, I think we simply can't take that for granted. That's why I am in, you know, more broadly the communications business, why I work on television. Um, it's very important that we stay one step ahead of the game. And there are great websites. I, if you don't know, um, I think it's called the Valley of the Shadow, which comes out of the University of Virginia, which takes two counties, one Confederate, one Union, and the Civil War. There are wonderful websites. The Library of Congress, goodness me. Um, American Memory is a wonderful instance of that, which is a marvelous open website for archival exploration by the young, from uh, people as young as 
fifth graders to people as young as, as some of you in your 80s. It's a so we have to actually be attuned, I think, to electronic media. But the one, one other, two other points I want to make very, very quickly. One is that the web has become an extraordinary place to access information. But it is a bit like, at the moment, about being, being hit by meteorites in no particular order. Um, it's a matter of saturation of information without gatekeepers to say what is true and what is false. And to go back to my favorite politician, the president of Iran, um, more people... More people are reading and believing the Protocols of the Elders of Zion because of the web right now than at any other time in the history of that notorious forgery. However, I would to say, look, here you all are. The great miracle of our moment is that the more we get lost in the world of cyberspace, the more hungry you are for face contact with writers, um, with, with lecturers, with the kind of humane, active reality of talking and learning and talking back. So we are not yet actually robots who are attached. You know, we haven't become entirely iPod people. If we do, I'll be long gone by then. So, so. Last one. one. I'm afraid it's last question. You boys want to fight it out together? I enjoyed, I enjoyed your talk except for one sentence. Oh, yeah. What was that? So that was, you, you said Megs said the United States was involved in a war of necessity. Well, I, didn't say he, I didn't say he actually said that. I said well, he okay. felt that. Sure. Yeah, but he certainly sure. felt no, that's that was the fine. case. And the sentence was, you said, and that has marked American history. Now, I was born in 1942. The right. United States has been at war almost every single year yes. of my life. Yeah, you would, make you, a, would you agree that yes, our no, wars you, you, since 1942 no, 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 are no, no. I, I, I come not to interrupt you, but to praise you. That's a very important point. Um, I, I do think we're making a film right now partly about which has as its subtext the decision to be taken in Afghanistan, but it is about the Korean War, the war we should all remember. And there, in the debates between MacArthur and Dean Acheson, Harry Truman and others, what constituted far, far from these shores a war of necessity, a war of choice, nothing really impelled us to occupy Grenada, I would say, actually. So you're absolutely right. We've been a bit trigger happy. But there are moments when the trigger happiness stops and a president or an opposition party or whatever says, we owe it, we are not a nation of soldiers, we are a nation of citizens who wear uniform, and we owe it to ourselves to have that debate again. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.